Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. So it's a pleasure to have uh, with us today Gasper Kacik from IST Austria, uh, who's going to deliver a set of uh, uh, three lectures, which will be uh, mixed black blackboard and slides. Uh, so please, Gasper. All right. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Antonio. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I like to come. I'm I'm originally from Slovenia, and so I traveled yesterday from Vienna on the train, and I noticed that um, after years where there was not really a convenience connection between Vienna and Trieste, now we are back to the old uh, monarchy line. So a direct train that you know. It does the, exactly. That's what I. So I think on the Austrian stretch they made it a bit faster, but it still takes nine hours. So I was surprised how come that you know when we were in Villa Piccina, why there is still one hour until arrival to Trieste. So you know they need to change the trains and kind of do all the circumstances. But it was very nice and romantic. Anyway. So um, all right. Uh, what what I would like to spend uh, these three lectures on is uh, is to talk about maximum entropy models. Um, I'm a physicist by training, uh, but mainly work on the interface between uh, physics and, and various types of problems in biology, which include neuroscience problems, but also cellular signaling problems. Um, and the way I was imagining delivering these lectures, so three lectures, well, would be um, sort of to combine today maybe a, a bit of a background on maximum entropy models on, on, on the Blackboard, just, be, just to get everyone onto the same page, and then to show applications of these ideas to data on slides, of course. Um, and so uh, I would like to highlight certain connections. So I think mainly the aim of my lectures while introducing these models is to highlight the connections. So this type of modeling, maximum entropy modeling, really emerges in very different fields of science. So depending on what your background is, you might recognize the following words. So if you're more from the machine learning side, um, you know, we would be talking about a class of generative models. Um, you know, you might recognize the words such as the Boltzmann machines or the restricted Boltzmann machines. Um, uh, if you are mainly coming from the statistics side, we are in some sense talking about uh, distributions from the exponential family class, where there is a well-defined set of sufficient statistics. And if your background is, is mainly physics or statistical physics, uh, then obviously the Boltzmann distribution would be one example, but actually, uh, how to say, in, in, let's say in the recent 15 years or so, there has been a resurgence of interest in these maximum entropy models, and you might read papers about inverse statistical mechanics or about the inverse Ising model and so on. And so all of these concepts, you know, pertain to kind of a common body of mathematics or physics, if you want. And so I would like to illustrate a little bit what we are talking about, and in particular, uh, focus on three types of uses of these models um, that are related but not the same. So one, the first use, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, and I'll illustrate it uh, on some data, spiking data from the retina, um, and I'll describe what this is. So the first use is, and maybe I sketched this down, uh, let me just find, so we we're talking about maximum entropy. Maximum entropy models, so the first use will be to uh, infer distributions uh, from limited data. Okay. Um, and again, I, I'll say more about this, but let me just put this, uh, the, the structure of the lectures down. The second use will be, uh, which I hope to do tomorrow, will be to use maximum entropy models as a very elaborate framework um, to construct null models from data against which you can do hypothesis testing. And I'll try to illustrate what I mean by that, okay? Um, so a framework, and this is kind of related to the first one, but in practice, what you do is somewhat different. A framework for building
null models. Um, you know, for, for then doing hypothesis tests. And the third application is kind of the most recent one. Um, and this is to construct what we call optimality priors. Um, for Bayesian inference. So here, you know, if you've if you've dealt with Bayesian inference of say parameters from data, you know that you have to specify some to, some type of prior over parameters typically, and there is kind of there has been a lot of discussion for what these prior should look like, what they should be, and this this last bit will be sort of our contribution for using a very non-trivial set of priors that we call optimality priors, and they are they have the form of maximum entropy distribution, so that's the connection as you will see. Um, and these priors can be used to link. That's why my lectures have the title of optimality theories. That they can be used to link um, a particular type of optimality theory that you have about the system with a finite number of data that you have collected about the system, and that's therefore to test that optimality theory. All right, so you know, kind of to give credit where it's due, if we want to trace back the origin, well, one of the origins of this uh, maximum entropy models, one looks back to the original work of Jaynes. Um, that is by now quite, quite, you know, far into the past. Um, 57 or 58, 57, this is in uh, Fisra. Um, one hundred six, and where where he this so and you know the title of this is information theory and statistical mechanics. It's a it's a paper that if you haven't read it is really worth reading, even if not the whole paper. It's a pretty short one, but if not anything else, read the introduction, yeah, because in the introduction, the 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 question that's that's taken up is the question of whether one can think of statistical mechanics um, really not as a sort of a particular theory that you derive from, you know, very like in a mechanistic system to talk about its states, microstates and so on, but whether you can think about statistical mechanics as really a statistical theory of about things about systems that you have to build with limited amount of information that you might have, right? So that's the viewpoint. And, and actually I, I like have a citation from the abstract because it's really great. So it says information theory that's how the paper begins, provides a constructive criterion for setting up probability distributions on the basis of partial knowledge and leads to a type of statistical inference called the max end estimate. It is the least biased estimate possible given the information, i.e. it is maximally non-committal with regards to missing information. And then he goes on already in the, in the abstract to say that it's actually possible to make a sharp distinction between, you know, viewing this kind of statistical mechanics as this statistical theory that has nothing in particular to do with the mechanistic underpinnings and about the mechanistic aspect of statistical mechanics. Unfortunately, they, of course, very nicely and productively connect, but you can discuss two separately. Um, and so, you know, this is good to have in mind. That's actually the viewpoint that, that we, we are going to be taking today. So let me now um, get a bit more detailed about the maximum entropy models. All right, so, right, we start, uh, so we, again, we'll start with this first point, uh, trying to build, construct probability distributions from, from, uh, from data, from limited data. And so, you know, to kind of set it up, let me start with a, a set of samples that I might have about the system. Here I denote them as follows, x1, x2, the numbers are indexing the samples. And so suppose I have, big T, which is my number of samples in the data. <clears throat> and, and these vectors in principle, they can live in, in some high dimensional continuous space that brings up some difficulties I might discuss in the end. So for now, let me limit myself to samples being um, discrete. Um, you can think of them as binary vectors, but they could be also living in some, you know, kind of not non non binary uh, but still discrete domain. Um, let me just get my notation. So uh, let's let's say my samples x, x t are uh, 
n dimensional, you know, and each x component can take q levels, let's say. So for q equal two, this would be binary vectors, let's say. Now, what we are looking for, so we are given this data, and what we want um, is uh, is build a distribution p of x. This is a generative distribution from which I can think that these samples have been drawn, right? That I observe. So I want to build, and it's a generative model because once I construct such a distribution, I could sample new samples, right? That you know, in some would be if you want similar. So these are representative draws, let's say, from 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 this distribution p of x. And now, you know, there is a there is a regime, of course, of this problem, um, which is trivial, right? So, so the trivial regime is, of course, if my number of samples is so large, I can just oversample this distribution and count because these are discrete uh, objects um, that I'm discussing now. So I can say that you know the number, roughly the number of samples, you know, is much larger than sort of q to the n. Then I can just build an empirical estimate. Estimate which would be or p hat, if you want, of x, right? Which is just some sort of accounting, right? It's one over p, uh, and I kind of sum over all the samples until big T, and I have some indicator function, right? Um, and of, of, you know, this is usually not the regime we're in. Uh, we are in the regime where we don't have enough samples to just to just count, and so we need to come up with something with something else, right? So usually, we are in the curse of dimensionality regime. Um, and I'll show you examples from neural recordings just to just to have a sense, right? If you if if we think of if we think of each sample, like if I can record in the brain or in the retina. And I record from n neurons, and each neuron in each little slice of time can either spike or not. So it's a binary, you know, there is a binary representation of their activity, right? If I if I only sample 10 neurons, okay, then their joint activity patterns live in the space of two to the 10, it's about a thousand dimensional space. And you know, in a typical neuroscience experiment, I can actually collect many more than 1,000 of such samples. So in that case, I'm still in this regime. But obviously now we record from many more than 10 neurons. So as soon as you record from 20, you require you know, many more than 1 million samples. And now we routinely record from tens of thousands or thousands, tens of thousands of neurons. So, you know, and the experiment durations have definitely not scaled as the number of samples is scaling. So we still typically record in the experiments for the duration of a few hours, and that's already very good. Okay, and in those few hours, you you cannot get you know the samples that would exponentially address this scaling of the state space. So, so typically we are in this regime where this is not true. You cannot sample, right? And so what we need, it's it's kind of obvious what we need. So we need some way of regularizing this distribution, right? Of using the samples to constrain something about it, but kind of regularizing it. And if you think of what would be possible good ideas, you can just recall that this same thing emerges, the same problem would emerge even for continuous distributions, right? So for continuous distributions, what you would do, this is just an aside, okay? So if X is a 1D continuous variable, and I want to talk about the PDF of X, right? Then I typically I collect some samples. Let me represent them by kind of little crosses, right? Something like that. And if from these samples I want to kind of construct an estimate of a, of a distribution, I maybe you know that generates the data. Maybe it's something like that. I don't know. What I'm implicitly or explicitly having to take into account for continuous cases, of course, that this distribution is in some way smooth. Okay, because if it's not smooth, then these points can simply be seen as kind of Delta functions in my distribution exactly where the samples lie, right? And this would be a terrible estimate of the underlying distribution because it's to totally overfit to this particular set of samples I observed. So in the continuous case, we impose some way, there is many methods for smoothness, let's say in kernel density estimation. And so the question is in these discrete spaces, is there a similar notion of smoothness right in this high dimensional space that we can think of um, and this is where you know as you'll see one way in which this smoothness comes in is through this maximum and prescription that we'll I'll now outline and this really follows 
match the reasoning in, 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 in the James paper, right? So what is the max and model or, or approach, if you want, um, it, it proceeds in, 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 in steps. So the first thing that you do is you use the, your finite data of these samples to compute, to estimate from the data, M, M is some selected number, could be one or could be more, M functions or statistics of the data, which are that are in this in this framework also called constraints. Um, so I will first write it and then explain. So F of the data. So I'll define this as one over. Okay, so so what I have is you know, I have some functions that I can evaluate over my, my data. Um, I, I enumerate them by, by mu, and mu runs from one to m. I have m of, of them. And what is this my notation here just represents an empirical average over the observed data set of these functions f. Okay, these functions can be anything. The maximum entropy framework does not tell you what this function should be. They can be very simple, right? If these are they can be sort of expectation values, let's say, of, uh, of individual components of this X. I'll give you examples later, but in general, you can frame it simply as, you know, some constraints, you know, operators, statistics, depending on where you come from. But these are things that you can estimate well, and you can discuss about their error bars and so on, on the, uh, uh, over the finite data set that you have observed. And now, once you have, once you have done that, we'll be looking for a probability distribution P that will exactly reproduce, in a way I'll just write down, this, these constraints. So it will match the constraints exactly. But there is many, many distributions that have that capacity to match uh, some, some finite set of constraints. And so we have to select from all of them a particular one that encapsulates this, some sort of notion of smoothness. And so, you know, Jane's idea is that the one distribution that you choose um, that matches all the constraints is a distribution that's at, at the same time as he says, most non-committal, right? So it's most random or has maximum entropy. So that is the reasoning. So we'll find, we'll find distribution P, I'll denote it by P hat, okay? That um, matches, all of these constraints exactly. While maximizing entropy. So if I write this down, right? So entropy in this case will, will just be our Shannon type entropy. So it's the sum, well, let me write it down, he has x log the base of the logarithm doesn't matter so we'll be trying to maximize the entropy of this distribution p hat this is our max and model uh, but in such a way that um, for every one of these constraints uh, f mu in this distribution, so that's the expectation value in this model, right, which is simply sum over all x, e hat, x, um, f mu of x, such this has to be equal to what has been estimated over data, right, for each mu, f mu in data. Okay, so it's a, it's a very, straightforward idea and it this particular problem you can view it as a constraint optimization problem right you're trying to maximize this while satisfying all these constraints also satisfying that the, uh, the distribution has to be normalized and so it's not uh terribly complicated to, to jump um from that problem statement into sort of a variational principle where we can find out what kind of a 
form this max and distribution has to have. Okay, and, and you can see before I write it down, you can see that this would satisfy what, what, what James was, was alluding to, right? So have a limited number of, so some limited information about, about my, um, my distribution, which are these constraints, I need to choose them, and then find a distribution that in some sense is most random, right? So this, if there is no constraint, and these P's are discrete distributions, Right, the distribution that maximizes the entropy without any other constraints, a uniform distribution. In some sense, you can think of a uniform discrete distribution sort of being most smooth, right? It doesn't have any structure. It's just flat over all the state space. And then as you need to satisfy constraints, you have to deform that distribution away from uniform in order to match the constraint, but still trying to keep us, if you want, as flat, as, as close to flat as possible, right? Okay, so you can, you can turn this into... Um, um, you can turn this into a constraint optimization problem for this distribution P. So it has the term that needs to be maximized, which is this, which is what we wrote there, uh, X P X log P X. Um, and then it has a constraint. So this will be a variational problem. I'll try to find the P. The P needs to normalize to one. So I need to put and you know a constraint that will achieve that. So I put a Lagrange multiplier, the big lambda, and I impose the summation over. Sorry. So so this is the normalization constraint that this lambda will will impose, and then there is m other constraints, right? Which are those other expectations. So I have a summation over all constraints. Each one comes with a Lagrange multiplier that I denote here by G mu. And each of these constraints requires the summation over X, P X, F mu X to be matched to data, you know, which is some constant, right? Because that's evaluated over the data. So I could put it in, but even if I don't put it in, it won't change the variational problem, right? And so, this, if you take this variation, you can and set it to zero, right? It, a very easy thing emerges because here you just take, you know, a derivative with respect to P, it goes away. Here you take the derivative with respect to P or left with the constraint because this is linear in P. And the only non-trivial term is this one. And so when you take P log P, a derivative with respect to P, right? You take a derivative with the first term, you're left with log P. And then the second term is again easy because it's P times one over P and it cancels, it's just a constant, right? So this you have done many times, I'm sure. So you get, when you set it to zero, you get, and you know, do, do a little bit of one line of algebra to rewrite it in, in a nice way. You get that maximum entropy models always have the following form. And so there is a normalization constant, which is your partition function. It's an exponential distribution, which in the exponent has, I'm sorry, has g mu f mu x, right? Has a linear, so this z emerges because you impose the normalization and I just renamed the constant into something that you're more used to from statistical physics. Um, and in the exponent, there is sort of a linear combination of the constraints that you're imposing, which are these, all these F mu's, and each of them is equipped with this Lagrange multiplier. Right, and these guys, so the non-trivial part of solving the problem, this was the trivial part of solving the problem, all the max and you know, models have this form, the non-trivial part comes from the fact that you have to set these guys now, right, to certain specific values. So set, and this is a, you know, these are m unknown numbers, if you want. Set this g mu such that such that these constraints, and I'll I will not copy them, right? I'll just put a star such that these constraints are met, right? Set g such that star is true. So you can view that 
as if you want, you can view the constraints as M constraints. So that's M equations for G mu. And unfortunately, they are nonlinear because obviously these G mu's are also in the partition function, right? Um, you can write them in, you can write these constraints in the form that you are used to from statistical physics. So you can you can say that D log Z over D G mu, right? This will be the expectation value of F mu in this model. So this thing has to be equal to the value of F mu evaluated over the data, right? And so this is what we are supposed to solve. Some cases for some selection of constraints, this is easy, but in general, it's not. Okay, because, because you have to know as, as in your statistical physics, the partition. Um, Good. Um, now, just if you read the James paper, there is a slight, slight, slight twist in how we apply it. Okay, so James in the paper, in the original paper, was, was talking about knowing some abstract quantity F about the distribution. Here, this, this you know, and what, what, would the, what would be sort of statistical mechanics look like under this constraint? The only difference that doesn't come so clearly out from his paper is that in our case, these constraint functions are not something that I would make up. They're actually something that empirically evaluates on, you know, is evaluated over the data, right? They come from a finite data set. But, you know, that's still fine. I think all the arguments that he talks about are, are, are kind of, you can make them uh, in, in, in this context. Um, let me just see if I didn't forget anything. Okay. Um, and so now you can, of course, now you see this connection that I was alluding to, to statistics, right? So this is sort of an exponential family of distributions with the sufficient statistics that are these guys, right? And these are the kind of conjugate, if you want, parameters. Um, right. So this, you can... Alternatively, right, these maximum entropy models are nothing but the probabilistic models for, for data. So if you want, let's say, to come up with a possible prescription, and it is the plain vanilla way to learn this, to, to infer or to learn this, these parameters, um, you, we can just... We can just um, ask... Let me do that. If we were to employ maximum likelihood learning to fit this unknown G mu, what would, what would that look like, right? So, you know, one way to view it is to solve this nonlinear set of equations, but the other way is to view the same problem is to infer this G mu using maximization of likelihood or log likelihood, if you will. And so I can just write down, given my data, given my final data D, right? That I had X1 to XD, I can write down the likelihood or log likelihood for this model. So the log likelihood would be the log of Right, assuming all, all samples are independent, it's the log of my P of X T, right? So I evaluate it over all the samples because the data is ID, I have a product for each uh, across all the data. And let me maybe explicitly write it down as, you know, a, a distribution over data that depends on these parameters, um, right? And if I, if I kind of unpack this, I get uh, the summation over samples um, log, right? And it's pretty nice because of course, if I take the log of P, um, I get the minus log of the partition and then the log of this exponent. So the exponent cancels out. So I have minus, um, wait, sorry. Uh, I have, uh, what do you want? I have minus log of the Z, right? And then I have plus um, the sum of G mu F X D mu, right? Yes, all right. And so one again, so one can one can derive from this log likelihood, one can one can derive a learning rule because I want 
to maximize the likelihood with respect to parameters g mu. Um, and this derivative is, is pretty nice. Why? Right here, uh, this is actually a constant. I mean, this does not depend on individual samples. So you can take it out of the sum. And then in this second term, right, you will recognize that I will have the sum over all samples of this function, which is just t times the expectation value of this function in the data, right? And so if I write down this, uh, this derivative, um, I get, right, and so, sorry, the, the, and the derivative of the log z with respect to g mu is precisely what I have here. So it's the expectation in the model, right? <clears throat> and so I get, I can rewrite this as, T times where T is the number of samples uh, minus up to a minus. I might have, I hope I didn't make a mistake at mu uh, in the model plus at mu in the data. And so, right, so it's the difference between the expectations in the data and the expectation in the model. And so from this, you can derive or you can propose a learning rule for, for, for these couplings, G mu. So you can make an iterative learning rule by which we'll climb the log likelihood gradient, right? So the gradient is here. So I can say that at, you know, at the next iteration for my couplings and Q is the iteration number. So I take what I have and I climb up a little bit, you know, on the gradient, right? With some learning rate alpha. Right, which has this thing, hopefully with the correct sign, but if not, one flips it. So F mu data minus F mu D hat mu. Right. And so you see that this, this particular thing has, so this particular, right, and this particular uh, learning rule has a correct fixed point, right? So you'll stop updating your couplings when this term is zero. This term is zero when in your model, the expectation is exactly as in your data, which is what we require. Um, and so this alpha here is some small learning rate. Just to remind you, this, this thing is just the number that you estimated over data. So that part is easy, okay? It's this you just do once in the data. This part is the expectation of my constraints in the current, under the current parameter, uh, coupling parameters. This is usually what's, what's maybe difficult to compute, right? So you have this exponential model and you have to compute the expectation values given these parameters at every learning step, okay? But once you have this, you take the difference and you just update your parameters a little bit. And this is sort of a plain, this is a, of course not the optimal learning rule. So it has the correct fixed point. There is, you know, improvements on this. But it's kind of just to illustrate is a plain vanilla simplest type of learning rule that you can get, right? Um, this problem for maximizing entropy subject to constraints is convex. So there is a guarantee. So there is theoretical work and you can look it up um, on KKT conditions as it is called. So it's a convex problem. So there is one solution. You can start, let's say with G mu, if you want zero, so zero or G mu, one, right? So initial value for the parameter, simply set them to zero, right? So the problem is not complex because it would have many optima for this G mu. There is only one set of solutions that you're fine. It might be difficult because this is not easy to compute as I'll try to show you for concrete examples, okay? So that bit is hard. The other, right, the other kind of climbing, the log likelihood and so on, that's not, that's not that hard. Um, okay, so, up to here, right, we have introduced the maximum entropy model, have this exponential form. Uh, you can fit it to data by solving these equations or by doing this type of iteration or maybe something more fancy. There is multiple ways to, to go around this. But just to, just to very clear, clarify this point, a maximum entropy model, right, is not, um, it's not a single model. It's a framework, right, of models that depend on which constraints you, cho you choose, right? And the choice of constraints is the thing that is subject specific. So you want to constrain your distribution, fine. What do you reproduce from data? Which set of statistics? That depends on the application. Now you could, of course, if you are very Bayesian, let's say inclined, you could start doing 
kind of formal model selection. You could say, you know, if I choose these constraints and construct a model versus these constraints and, 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 uh, and, and build a model, you know, which, and I do model comparison, which set of constraints is most informative or generalizes better and so on. So one can do all of that. But typically, the choice of constraints is up to sort of a, a specific problem that you're addressing. And, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll try to move this a little further to illustrate what I mean by that. Okay. Um, all right. Good. So that is done. Let me maybe make now this, uh, you know, both for illustrative purposes, but because we are actually already moving to max and models that can be applied to data. Let me uh, give you a more concrete example where I will choose the constraints. Um, and in particular, I'll try to motivates that for discrete distributions, there is a, um, that we are discussing now, there is a particular a privileged or special set of, uh, or a ladder of distributional approximations that that is interesting to discuss irrespective of your data set, okay? So this will serve both to construct this ladder of approximating this max and distributions and to make this a little bit more concrete. Okay, um, so we start in the following way. I'll enumerate this by zero, and I'll say that there is a P zero of X. That's a trivial case, right? Which is a max N distribution with no constraint. And let me further develop this for X being binary vectors, okay? It generalizes for all discrete vectors, but let me just do binary here. So we already said max N distribution with no constraints for these binary vectors is just a uniform distribution, right? So this is uniform. And in particular, PX of zero will just be one over two to the N if N is the num, you know, dimensionality of these vectors, okay? So that's trivial. All right, so then I can construct the next, you know, and obviously has nothing to do with data, right? This is this is irrespective of what whatever the data is. So let me now build the next uh, distribution in such a hierarchy. So I'll work out a max n distribution that will match the data in all single single element marginals. Okay, max n distribution that constrains. the expectation value of X I. So I is now from one to N or the empirical average, sorry, I should say, um, of, of, of each of the components to, you know, to whatever is in the data, which I'll denote by M I. So this is from data, right? So this is the average of every X, okay? So that's, that's a simple distribution. Now we know what form it has to have. So this P1, right, has to be written as one over Z1 exponent. And then with the usual physics notation, right, I have here one to N, H, I, X, I, where H are now these Lagrange multipliers that in, uh, you know, to kind of link it to the Ising model that you might know, I denoted these parameters now by H, right? And so this is, so this is a max N by what we derived before. It's a max N distribution that has this type of constraint, right? So each xi comes here into the exponent with the linear uh, coefficient. And since this, in the, this is a, a distribution that factorizes, right? So I can, because it has a, right? It factorizes in xi. So I can write it as a product of, you know, one over z1i times x hi xi. And now this is the one where it's still very, trivial to solve, right? Because I can actually analytically get the formula for this HI, right? So I know that um, X, so E to HI divided by the corresponding partition, which is if I have binary zero one vectors, it would be E to HI plus one. So this thing has to be equal to, to this uh, data expectation value. And from this, I can just compute, right? That HI has to be the log 
uh, as you know, and I always forget what's up and what's down M, M1 minus M. So M I, M I one I minus M I, right? So the maximum entropy distribution that's consistent with single point marginals is a trivial factorizable distribution that's written down here for which the parameters are directly computable from data. Easy, right? So there's like independent spins if you want. Okay, so the first, the first kind of non-trivial one in a way that's actually not that easy to compute is the next order approximation, right? So I hope you see what, what we are constructing here. We are constructing a set of distributions that match data in the mean values. And now the next level will be to match not only the mean values, but also the pairwise correlations, right? So this will be our next model. So zero, one, P2. Right, P2 of X. So max and distribution that constrains that constrains both the expectation value of X. Oh, sorry, the av empirical average of X of XI as before. So this is a better model, right? It will reproduce exactly what this one reproduced exactly, but and it will also reproduce XI xj average in the data which i'll denote as cij note it doesn't matter whether i do connected or not connected because i'm actually getting the means correct already so i can constrain either the non-connected or connected correlation right and so this for this guy we also so since we derived what's the general form we also know what the solution is right so it will look like this Right, as before, it will have HIXI uh, plus, and I again, I'm just you know, in generic max and all of these Lagrange multipliers were G mu, but I'm now writing them up in, in the form that is most familiar from statistical physics, right? So, so now I have these terms that. I need to set to match the means and these terms that, are, you know, if you want parameters that are set to exactly reproduce the, uh, the average, the, the measured correlation function. Now, just, just to clear up, right? This H, the values of this H will not be the same as the values from this H, okay? Because obviously by imposing, it's a nonlinear problem. So when I put JIJ in, I have to also retweak the H so that these observables come out correct, okay? So these are not numerically, they're not the same. Okay, um, so this type of model now comes with, so this is, okay, so here we have the uniform distribution, here we have what we call independent or factorizable approximation. This guy is pairwise Ising or Ising-like, right? If you, I'll say why, or it is also called a Boltzmann machine. So um, in general now, right, if I give you the means and the covariances, and this can be some arbitrary numbers that are measured from the data, there is no closed form solution for H and J. There are approximate schemes for how to compute it, but you know from statistical physics, we often compute the inverse, pro well, the forward problem. So we set, the, we decide what the magnetic field is, that's an external control parameter, we specify some structure on JIJ. Let's say we say these are nearest neighbor, square lattice, I interactions. And then, you know, you turn the crank of statistical physics and compute the partition or the free energy and compute from it the observables, right? So now we are going the other way. We're giving the observers and need to find out these guys. And in particular, unless nature is very kind to us and very nice, you know, the, the set of JIJ, and I'll show you uh, that, and HI won't have any nice form, right? Like, you know, that all spins would be acted on the same field or that, you know, the couplings just happen between nearest neighbors and so on. So this could happen, but typically doesn't, right? Um, and so this means that now the, the hard part of fitting this is, is precisely because Already a forwardizing is difficult, right? In general, if you get if you get that to compute the partition function, but here you have to do that in the learning loop, right? As you update your parameters, 
remember the learning rule, you have given a set of H and J as you learn them, you have to be able to compute the, uh, the, um, the, the M and the C. And for that, you either need the partition, which you don't have, or you can do Monte Carlo sampling to get the approximate, given the parameters to get the approximate observers, right? That you can always do by Monte Carlo sampling, of course, but then they will have the error bar and then your learning is stochastic learning and so on. But, you know, it has all been done. Uh, and, you know, it can be done to some extent. Okay. So again, that's the most random distribution that's consistent with first and second order margins. And you can see that we can just march down this hierarchy, right? We can now also constrain, you know, the third order correlation function, Cijk, and our model will gain Kij, Kx, Ix, Ax, uh, and so on, right? And at some point, right, because these are discrete distributions, you will march down to the point where you constrain for n, let's say, binary units, you constrain correlation functions of order n, of the last order that's possible in a finite system. And at that point, by definition, your max and model will be exactly the empirical distribution of the data because you have matched all the marginals, right? From first to highest order and with all the marginals specified, the discrete distribution is fully specified, okay? So there is some notion, right? We, of course, we typically truncate it when we describe the data at some low order. That's what we hope. But in principle, this ladder just continues up to, you know, Pn of x, which is, you know, some crazy distribution with, with, with you know, all n product terms in it and lots of coupling constants, okay? So I won't even write it down. But, and you might think that we have now cheated somehow, you know, the ex curse of dimensionality because I, in, in the beginning I said we have finite data, you cannot hope to get a model, right, of the joint distribution by just sampling. Then I introduce this max end. There is now this hierarchy, and you can say, okay, so I just march down the hierarchy. I constrain all the ends or their marginal terms, and I have described the full data distribution. So how did I do that? And of course, the problem is that, you know, these distributions constrain different statistics of the data. But if your data is limited. Your, uh, your empirical estimates of these statistics are getting of worse and worse quality. So maybe it's easy to estimate the means, maybe you still have enough data to estimate the covariance matrix, but obviously with a finite amount of samples, right? Your estimates of higher order statistics get all weird, I mean, unreliable, and therefore this sequence of distributions will start overfitting as always those higher order terms which now depend on finite sampling, okay? but. As said, what's nice about this type of modeling framework vis-a-vis -a, -vis a generic maximum likelihood inference of high dimensional models is that since you know what the st sufficient statistics of this is before you even build the model, you can estimate empirically these correlation functions and put an error bar on them and kind of know upfront how reliable each statistical estimate is. And then that informs you what you should or should not be including in your model, if you want, at least as a guideline, okay? Right, so this hierarchy, um, yeah, this hierarchy has another very nice uh, thing. And this is, I, I guess I'll say this, and then I'll stop for today with, with the blackboard and show some things on the slides. Um, each, of these, each of these constructions, right? So the, the uniform distribution, the independent model, the kind of the pairwise model and the third order model and so on, each one, at least in principle, has an entropy associated with it, right? So you can compute the entropy of this guy, and you know that the entropy over n binary spins is just n bits for this guy. You can compute the entropy of this guy, right? Which is still simple. I don't have the formula, but, you know, you can, you can it's uh, n independent things. So just add up the n independent entropies for each of the spins, right? There is an entropy of this guy, which is obviously not very easy to compute because you need a partition for it, but it exists, okay? So there is a sequence if you want. So this ladder of models defines a sequence, sequence of entropies. So there is an S zero, which is this independent, you know, which is the N bits. There is a, there is a, and this, and there is S1, which is the entropy of the independent model. There is the S2, which is the entropy of the pairwise approximation. There is an S3 and so on and so on until we reach Sn, okay? Sn is the entropy of that 
final distribution that matches all, 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 all uh, kind of all marginal constraints, which is it, which then has to be the entropy of the empirical distribution over the data, right? Um, and every time, because these models are in, in sort of net kind of impose, so each next model uh, constrains all the constraints of the previous model. As soon as in the max and framework you impose a new constraint, the entropy can only go down because you impose extra statistical structure or stay the same and the constraint is, is void. And so there is a set of there is inequalities here, right? So this has to be larger or equal, this is larger or equal, this is larger or equal, and so on, right? And in particular, this fact um, allows you to decompose an interesting quantity that I, I'll try to write, um, but I would like to write it close. So I'll just erase this pairwise thing. <clears throat> the fact that uh, you have this uh, kind of hierarchy of entropies allows you to decompose the following quantity in a very nice way. So um, how should I how should I do that? Let me do one more thing. So when you go from uniform model to the model that's constrained by argin, uh, by, by the margins, the, the entropy drops from S0 to S1, right? Because of the imposition of marginal constraints. When you go from here to here, you impose pairwise structure. So you go from independent to pairwise coupled system. And this drop in entropy is typically denoted by, or typically you can denote it by, you know, that's a difference. That is S1 minus S2. It's kind of I, it's, it's called a connected, connected information of order two. As you go from here to here, there is an additional drop which is strictly because you added third order constraints, right? So, and so on. And what, so these are differences between consecutive entropies. And so what these differences allow you to do is to decompose a quantity that's called multi-information. I'll define it in a second, multi-information into a sequence of non-negative contributions, which are these, contributions here. So all of these are greater or equal to zero. There is a unique decomposition because there is a unique hierarchy of max and models, right? And so this is a decomposition of the total statistical correlation structure in the data order by order. So what is, you know, how much is pairwise interactions are responsible for third order and so on. For this to make sense, I need to tell you what I is. So what is this multi-information? So now I, I rely a little bit maybe on the background if you have it. If this makes sense for you, that's great. If not, it's not a catastrophe. So the multi-information you can view as a kullback leibler distance between the full distribution over the data and its and the independent uh, model, which has which has in which the spins are independent, non-interacting. Okay. So P1 of X. So this is a full joint distribution. So it has all correlations inside. And this is, you know, the, 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 this distribution that only matches first order margins and has no interactions inside. So this is a non, so DKL is a, is a information theoretic non-negative measure in bits. It tells you, you know, how much in bits, how much statistical structure there is when you go from here to the full joint. And what I'm asserting is that this, guy can be decomposed in order by order contributions in a unique way. So how much of this is due to pairs, due to triplets, due to quadruplets and so on. And that's oftentimes empirically useful, right? Because you can, you can, you can construct these max and approximations and ask, you know, how much is explained by pairs, how much is there that's not explained by pairs or by third order interactions and so on. Um, this, by, by the way, this multi information for those of you who, who know this, uh, uh, these quantities, if X was a two-dimensional vector, um, just for fun, right? For fun, if I wrote DKL between P, X, and Y, and these are now, you know, so this is a vector, but let's suppose these are now um, uh, scalar variables, right? So if, if I wrote this, 
So these are the marginal distributions of X and of Y, right? Because this is factorized. So I can write it as, I can write independent models as a, as a product of two factorial distribution, two marginals. Right? So if I write it like that, you will recognize that I is just the mutual information between X and Y. So you can see the multi-information as a multivariate generalization of the mutual information for those of you who are familiar with mutual information already, okay? So it's a measure of the total amount of statistical structure. Okay, so, all right. So let me now make a few concluding remarks and then I'll see how much time I still have to show you stuff on the slides. So we go until 12, okay. Yes. If we, if we look at this backwards, is this the type of quality at work? Um, so it's a question. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's directly the DPI. I mean, the DPI, well, at least the data processing, the data processing inequality that, that I'm familiar with, with is always phrased in terms of, um, um, you know, a set of mutual information terms that, that, that proceed via, right? So when you have, right? Um, where, where you have stochastic variables and there is sort of dependencies between them, right? You have a limit on the mutual information between these two based on these two, let's say. Um, I'm not, so the, the the way this was shown, I don't think it was by recasting into DPI, but maybe it's possible to do it by, by doing that. I just don't know. So for those of you, like if you are interested in, in, in these informational decompositions, there is a, a PRL paper by uh, Schneidman et al., that is entirely, I think, network information and connected correlations. Um, but, you know, just if you, if you want the reference, I, I'm, I'm happy to give that. Um, okay. So, you know, let me now spend, without, you know, writing much down, but, but let, let me now spend a few moments kind of motivating. So why we are, now that you know a little bit about Max and models, uh, why we would, why would one build them? You know what? What like what good can come out of them? Okay, um, and because my maximum these models do provide some insight. I want to say what that is, but of course they're not. You know they're not. Uh, how to say they? They also have minuses, and so uh, you know I'd like to discuss a little bit what you can get get from them and 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 what are their limitations. Um, so the first. So let me first say that these are not, by no means are maximum entropy models, the most expressive or even close to type of models. And since this is a machine learning uh, school as well, right? They're by, by no means more like a very expressive type of model. Okay, so there is, the, if you want a very good performance on test data for this type of generative discrete state space models, you oftentimes will not choose a maxent model. It's difficult to fit, even the pairwise models are actually difficult to fit. And there is a variant of, of, of these models, you know, that, that's designed to be much more expressive that you might know, um, that's called the restricted Boltzmann machine. Okay, so this Boltzmann machines were these pairwise approximations, right? Um, so let me just say, so why use them? And I don't think the answer is because they're ex not because they're expressive. Um, so just just to sketch, right? So if let me let me sketch what a restricted Boltzmann machine is because it's very connected in form to this to the Boltzmann machines that you saw here. It kind of is for me it was always funny that it's called a restricted Boltzmann machine, even though it's you know expressive power is actually greater than typically of the of the kind of model that, that you saw. Um, so this is a probabilistic model where I think of uh, I'll draw a graphical diagram. So these these are these are my x units, so the you know the binary samples that that I was talking about, and I postulate there exist some variables y that I will not see. And you know the lines I'm showing are kind of dependency lines. I'll, I'll write on the mathematical form. Um, so these are as now you know maybe n-dimensional uh, sort of n-dimensional discrete vectors, and I consider joint distributions between x and y that are of the pairwise form. So this will be this will now look as the pairwise model. Uh, let me write it down and then talk about it. 
I uh, H, or let me write it H I X I plus sum over J uh, V J Y J plus a pairwise term I J J I J X I Y J. So I consider joint distributions of that form where I have a bias, like a field on every one of the X's, okay? I have a field V on every one of the Y's and I have a coupling, ma coupling matrix if you want, but it's only permitted to couple X's to Y's. So these are these lines. There is no, it's not permitted to couple Y to Y or X to X, okay? So just across the two layers. The, the assumption is this is the latent non-seen variable layer and these are my visible units i mean these these are these are the data that i sample and then the model that fit i mean this is kind of a full structure of, of this probabilistic model but then what i will be fitting to data is of course the marginal of this so it's the sum over all y over all latent variables p x comma y okay so and of course, now I can, you know, if my data, like before, data D is a set of observed such vectors, I can try to, right? I could, this is a probabilistic model, so I can try to learn the H and the, and the V and the J and so on. And I won't talk about that. What, what I want to say is that this particular, for instance, model class, first of all, it has, this one it has full expressive power. So in principle, it can model any probability distribution. If you have enough latent variables and you can convince yourself that, that you know at worst you can have two to the n of these latent variables and then you can actually explain sort of the probability of any pattern with this type of model so it's like in deep learning this is actually a universal if you want approximator or a universal modeling tool um, for for discrete distributions it has some other because of this conditional independence of the two layers right so the axes are independent between themselves conditioned on Y's and vice versa, there is some very nice learning algorithms for this and so on. So if you want, and you know, we have played around with this, applied it to neural data, it works great on some data sets and so on, and it has better performance than the pairwise model, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you know, you, you might want to ask me, why am I talking about Maxent models? Why don't we just do that? Because for many data, you know, it's actually better, okay? And so the answer, is the following, I mean, one part of the answer is, of course, this is in some sense a black box model. It's actually hard to understand what is learning. The fact that max and models are limited, that they have sufficient statistics gives you interpretation or can give you interpretation. That's what I wanted to show you on data, okay? Um, and I'll hint at what some of these interpretations are, but, you know, one of them is it, you know, of max and class. It's, it's a gener generative model that can produce samples from a high dimensional distribution, but what went in is just pairwise structure of the data, nothing more, okay? So, so you can ask how much of the complexity of the data is accounted for by just a pairwise structure? That's the separation that, you know, that Maxent allows you to make or like pairwise plus three point or whatever you want, you know? So interpretability is one thing. The second is, of course, there is all sorts of links between the pairwise models and other type of max time construction and statistical physics. Uh, one has to be very careful. I'll say why, but there is a lot of stuff from statistical physics that carries over. Also the ways like how do you actually compute the entropy of the max and models and so on. So we can do it because of the developments in statistical physics. Uh, and there is all sorts of tools that we can use. Um, you know, we can have all the fancy Monte Carlo sampling schemes and so on, right, that, that are at our disposal. So the tools are there, interpretability is there. Um, the third point that kind of the third, so, well, second or what, what reason is um, that there is a number of success cases for max and models, despite their limitations, um, when we observe that the correlation structure of the data is very complicated, but then to that data, you fit a pairwise Ising model, you extract these parameters, JIJ, Ising-like couplings, and you realize that couplings are much simpler than the observed correlations. Okay, the classical, of course, the classic example would be, you have three nodes, A, B, C, okay? There is, so these are three neurons or three, doesn't matter, or three, you know, positions in a, in a, in a protein, 
And you can measure the correlations between these guys. So there is some correlation between A and C. There is some correlation between A and B. And there is, of course, some correlation between B and C. Um, these are some non-zero numbers that you can estimate from data. You construct your, your pairwise max cent model, and you might infer that there is, between these two guys, let's say I'm making it up, there is some non-zero interaction, JAB, and between these two guys, there is some non-zero interaction, JAC, but actually between these two guys, it's consistent with zero interaction between them, right? So the, so the, the underlying set of interactions is much sparser than the correlation structure. And of course, this you would observe even if you played around with your Ising one, right? If you play around with the nearest neighbor Ising on the lattice, then the, of all the JIJ, only the nearest neighbors are non-zero. But if you compute the correlation across spins across the lattice, then of course, next, you know, nearest neighbor correlation is not zero. Next nearest neighbor correlation is also not zero, right? And correlation it kind of is extending. And if you're close to crit critical point, it extends really far, okay? So correlations are non-zero, but interactions, you know, can be just nearest neighbor, right? Much sparser. And so the hope is that for some data sets, this happens. And indeed, there is much success. Actually, this is what our group has not been working on, but uh, um, there is much success that you might be familiar with when people align protein sequences. Um, and from the, you know, for, there is a whole set of proteins, high sequences from kind of extent related organisms. And then what you do is you build this type of pairwise model, basically. But of course, you know, proteins, protein sequences are not binary. They have, you know, 20 amino acids or 20 letters at each position, but it's still discrete. So it's kind of a POTS-like model, if you want, instead of ising like model. And then from the correlation of these sequences, you learn that certain positions in the protein, they have non-zero, if you want, coupling. And that coupling is much more strongly indicative of actual underlying physical contact in the 3D protein structure between those pairs of positions than it's any sort of direct correlation measure, right? So this is called a direct DCA or direct coupling analysis. And, you know, versions of it has, have seen much success. And it's the underlying reason is this, this type of, you know, this type of phenomenon. The, third, the, the next point I would like to make is a warning point. So maximum entropy models resemble thermodynamic equilibrium models a lot. And you might be fooled into thinking that that's exactly the same thing. As so our maximum entropy formalism, you can apply to any stationary distribution it, to, you know, or samples from you know, some stationary process. Those samples do not need to be generated by a physical process at equilibrium. Equilibrium thermodynamic distribution, well, statistical mechanics at equilibrium is a subset of max and models, but vice versa does not hold, right? You can build max and distributions for stuff that's not equilibrium, okay? Even though it looks like Ising, but note that in the models that we infer, there is no separate notion of temperature pulled out. There is, there was no beta standing in front of, of that, okay? Um, and so, you, the math is almost the same, but interpretation one has to be careful about because, you know, some formula still hold, but you cannot interpret it necessarily as an energy or, you know, or a temperature or so on. It's like energy-like, temperature-like, and so on. There is also other things that I hope you will see from, from what I show you. Um, things that in statistical physics we will do as a natural assumption we don't even question. So, for instance, when we write down uh, various types of eyes, true Ising models, you know, we often th think of thermodynamic limits. We think of how J's need to scale as N goes to infinity and so on. Many of these things are not, how to say, warranted when you look at finite data sets, right? There does not need to be a thermodynamic limit if we study networks of neurons that are at most 300 neurons long. If we study sequences of amino acids that might be a few hundred long, but they're not, in the, not necessarily the thermodynamic limit would apply, okay? Notions of typicality and so on. So it's a, it's a neat, like also theoretically, these models are interesting, right? Uh, and we should be careful about what we carry over from physics. Okay. Um, so as I said, all of these constructions easily carry over to discrete non-binary distributions. Continuous, it's hard. Um, there is, right? So for continuous distributions, you can define maximum entropy models, um, but you know, certain things become more vague as, as, is, as you might be used to for entropy of continuous PDFs is already a weird object. For instance, you know, if you think of continuous uh, distributions that for, for which you constrain the first, second, and third order moments, well, if it's over the infinite domain, these things are not even normalizable. So, I mean, there is, there is other types of issues which we don't have with discrete. Um, and I think 
that has been less worked out. Um, there, and the last bit is there is also generalization from what, what I was explaining to, um, to samples that are not independent. So right now we always thought of data as being, remember, it's a kind of a collection of samples that I can see as being drawn from some distribution that I'm looking for, P of X, IID samples, right? Now, if these were times, like if this is actually a time index and this is of correlated data because it's generated by some times underlying time series process, right? Then, you know, you can still build this type of models, of course, for it, but you're neglecting the time correlations. They can be included because you can think of building distributions over sequences of X, time sequences of X. And then you start, you need to constrain also across time correlations, not just across component correlations. And just to give you a reference, so this is also has been introduced and, and people work on this. This is something that you will find under the name of maximum um, caliber. So maximum caliber is, you know, so you can see this sort of a superset of the, the, the type of nice and models. All right. Um, maybe I stop here and then if any of you, if, if there is any question now, I'll take it. Uh, and if not, I'll give you just as a setup for tomorrow on the slides, like some, you know, moving to more towards an application of neural system, a little bit more relaxed, like an intro of what the data is and what we try to achieve. But if anyone has any question now, maybe it's a good. And then meanwhile, I, 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 I share the screen, right? All right. Ah, yes. Um. So this multi information, like, uh, could you, for example, like see how it is the trend? Like, if you cut it at different orders, like uh, I two, I two mm -hmm. plus I three, look at how the curve behaves to decide. Okay, if the curve like basically stops changing, let's say okay, this level of cor uh, correlation is enough to describe all my data, and there is no further. I, I think so. I think this is at least empirically how it is often done. Uh, you know, you kind of look at how the how the mutual uh, how the multi information is saturating as you include order by order. You know, is there some particular knee and so on? And of course, it in reality is is a bit more nuanced, right? Because you're limited by finite data. So at some point, you know, whether you're you know you have to be careful also about how things generalize and so on. But in, indeed, you could do what you, what you're suggesting. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So All oh, right. Uh, there is a question in the chat. So, it... ah, so wait, I didn't fall. So the question is whether the max and models do well or poorly with dependent data. So the answer to that is like, so the, right, it, it really depends. So I think the, the, you can always fit a, a max and model also on correlated data. Um, but of course, by construction, it will not capture, I mean, by construction, right? It will not capture anything about the temporal correlation so long as you don't start also constraining it by a cross sample, across time correlation, in which case it becomes the maximum caliber. How well that does, you know, it's an empirical question, right? Whether you need to include just uh, short, short term correlations or, I mean, this depends what's in the data, right? Whether it has long term correlation structure, short term and so on. Um, but but in terms of the framework, it really just everything almost carries over, even if you, you just need to think about this higher dimensional object. So not about just X vector in P of over X vector, but P over a sequence of vectors, right? So it's more nuisance to deal with, but it's not, not new math. Sure. Uh, one thing in which I've seen Maxent models used is, um, you know, when you have observations, say, in genomics, where you have millions of uh, cells, uh, but then there is an issue that you're observing an, an average with added noise, which is the measurement process. So can you do Maxent when you actually have, um, you know, an additional process of noise added on the constraints? I, I never found out that. I think, uh, I mean, 
you know, you can. The question is, what do you learn, right? Uh, right. So, so you would. I guess you would have to. Um, maybe I say something a little bit about that in the in the neuroscience. So I've thought less. So let me say like this: I've thought less about uh, what happens if you have experimental noise added to it, simply because we were not faced with so many cases in what I'm going to show. But what we what you can do with careful max and construction that are richer than what I showed is, is you can start partitioning uh, the variability, right? So you can have, you know, sources of, well, fluctuation if you want, right? Because, you know, neurons are exposed to external stimulus that fluctuates versus because in, in the circuit, there is various types of correlations. Um, so you can design max and models that tease these apart, um, which then will mean that they have you know, they're not, let's say, they're not only constraining the total correlation, because from that you cannot know whether that's due to, you know, uh, stimulus or noise or intrinsic circuitry, but you're asking the models to constrain correlations conditional on other variables that you have control over. I don't know if you can then fit experimental noise, per se, in that process, right? So maybe you can fit extra knowledge if you have calibration experiments, let's say, right? Um, but I haven't seen this done. So I don't know about, about how to do it. Thanks. All right. So let me just, I'll just lay out the introduction. Um, it's good. And then we'll cut at the, the appropriate place. Okay. So what I, what I would like to do, uh, and this is work that uh, is, is by now reasonably old. So it's about 10 years um, and other examples will be newer. So I want to introduce you to, um, Ah, it's right there, to uh, neural population coding, um, and in particular to retinal experiments, and then show how maximum entropy models that you've seen can be applied to those data sets. And in particular, how does one choose the constraints and what insights they get us for neural coding? Um, so, all right. So just two, three slides about the biological system. So you can view, so this is a cross section through a um, vertebrate retina, um, light, Light stimulates the photoreceptors. Um, and then photoreceptors are neurons that transduce light into sort of car electrical currents. And then these signals filter through some circuitry that's very stereotyped and has been well studied. And for us, it's not that important. But the end of this cascade are these guys. These are retinal ganglion cells. Um, and these are spiking neurons. So they, they, have, they have discrete outputs. They either are silent or they spike. Um, and their axons are bundled together in the optic nerve that goes to the brain. So basically, all that our brain gets about the visual world are signals in this nerve, okay? So all the other stuff is reconstructed by your visual cortex from these signals that come from the retina. So it's a, if you can view this as a transformation device, right? From light to this spiking activity. And you can ask, therefore, in this system, very nice questions about what's known as population coding, which is, you know, it's one of the basic questions in neuroscience, which is how a collective, how, how a population of neurons, like how the response of all of these guys together encode for the stimuli. And that's in particular interesting when stimuli are natural stimuli, which are very rich with lots of features in it, right? So of course you can show the retina also very simple stimuli, like individual dots or, you know, lines or bars or whatever, but, you know, retina is presumably as complicated as it is because it needs to you know, transduce signals about a rich visual world. So you, one can study that in an experimental setup. So this is a, uh, so I was sharing my time at Princeton when Olivier Marr was there. He's an experimentalist who's now in Paris in the Institute of Vision. And while, while he was there, they developed this sort of a microelectrode array recording device. Uh, so these little dots are electrodes. Sometimes they are spaced 30 microns, sometimes 60 micron apart. So here is, there is 252, I think. And what you do is you dissect the retina from the animal. So this dissect the eye out, then you take the retina out and it's like a little kind of square millimeter type piece of a tissue uh, that you can then, this is typically done in this case, it's from salamander. It can be done from mouse, uh, et cetera. So you press the retina down onto this array. And if you keep it happy and perfused and then so on, it will actually sur survive for salamander for up to eight hours or six hours. You can record from it while you project any stimulus on top. Okay, and and these these little electrodes will then pick up, and so here is the, here is actually these are the electrodes, and these are the bodies of these retinal ganglion cells on top of the array. So you can pick their electrical activity, and if you do some signal processing, you can assign right, you can isolate from these signals 
when which of the neurons spiked. Okay, so you get this high dimensional recording uh, that I'll show you next. Um, but importantly, retina is retinotopic. Okay, so a little piece of retina, so the retina is big, but the piece that's over the array, it's the piece that looks into a small angle of the visual world. Okay, so, so everything that happens in this part of the world is encoded by some neurons that you can record. And in this preparation, it's very nice because most of the neurons that are looking into some part of the visual world can be recorded. Now, if you go to the cortex, that's not the case. Okay, even if you can record tens of thousands of neurons, you know that there is other millions that you are not seeing in your experiment. Okay, so in this particular case, you're actually recording from the majority of the neurons that encode the stimulus. Um, and so, yeah, so this, this is an old movie. Maybe you have seen it because I keep play, I like it. Um, so this will be the stimulus that was actually shown to the retina. So it will be of a, it's salamander. So it likes looking at watery things. So it's fish swimming around. Uh, I'll show the movie. So the movie will play. And then each one of the recorded neurons, you can determine by a separate calibration experiment, which part of the visual world is, is it sensitive to. Right, so there is an example neuron that is looking at this particular part. So that's the center of its receptive field, if you are familiar with this. And because we don't, I mean, Olivier records not just from one, he records from many neurons. If you put all of them on top, this is what they cover. So as I said, you know, this subpopulation covers one piece of the visual world, which is that piece right there. And so if you want to interpret the movie, now the movie will play. And then every time a neuron fires, its ellipse will appear for, for a brief moment, right? This is where it looks. So let me see if I get this going. So there is some, so it's looking here. Not much is happening. So there's not much activity. And then a fish will cross it, right? So and as it crosses it, you see, you know, it's kind of moving stuff. It excites the neurons and so on. So of course, the movie is longer. And this is just a little clip. But just to give you a glimpse of how this looks like, right? And you can repeat the same movie many times and, and do all sorts of tricks with it. So what comes out of this experiment is then a set of samples in time. So these, these are neurons. So each, each line is a response of one neuron. When it's dark, it made a spike. So there's little blips, right? So this is time. These are neurons. And if you zoom in, right, you can represent this, this uh, raster, as it is called. You can represent it as a collection of, of, of these binary words, right? Uh, where one means the neuron, some neuron spiked, and zero means it didn't spike. This is discretized in 20 millisecond time beams. There is a long discussion of neurophysiology why 20 millisecond. There is a reason for that. It's connected with neural integration times and so on and correlation functions. Happy to discuss. It's not that important for now. But let, let, let me say that that's typically the precision at which, I mean, the precision at which these neurons spike is, is, is sort of below 20 millisecond, right? So they will time their spikes reproducibly on natural stimuli to within this bin reproducibly, okay? And so once you have this raster, you can ask many questions and I'll just motivate them and then we'll end up for today. Um, so you can ask a number of questions and the simplest question is about the vocabulary. If you, if you think these are the words that, you know, these binary combinations are, of course, of symbols that are being sent to, uh, to the cortex, you can ask about the probability distribution over these words. And here, there, there was this question, obviously, these are correlated in time, this is a time process, they're driven by the stimuli, right? And so asking just about their distribution as if they were independent is missing a lot of structure, but turns out it's still a non-trivial problem and an interesting one. So it's a little bit like taking a book, right? And, and thinking about the distribution of words in a book and ignoring that words come in sequences and so on, right? It's just looking at what words are used with what frequency. Can we learn something from that, okay? So you can try to take these samples and build models for that distribution, which is what um, I'll show you with Max N. But of course, there's all sorts of other questions. So you can, for instance, if you take the stimulus and repeat the same stimulus over and over and over again, so there is now many repeats, okay, then the neurons will not respond in exactly the same way because they, there is noise in the system, even if the stimulus is exactly the same. And then, of course, you can talk about the distribution of the words conditional on time. So just over the same time being. So stimulus was exactly the same. And so all of these responses must mean the same to the brain, right? Um, and you can condition either on time or you can condition directly on the stimulus. So you can build this type of conditional models and Maxent can be used for that as well, but I won't, I won't show it. Um, or you can do the inverse problem, 
Okay, you can ask, given that I observed a certain sequence of these spikes, can I reconstruct back the stimulus? And that's called decoding. Um, so many groups have done this, so for us included, this is basically, can I read the neural code? So if I only listen to the neurons, can I reconstruct the full movie, right? And, and or how well, or which features of the movie can I reconstruct? And a lot of work with modern machine learning has also been done on this decoding problem, right? Uh, can I read the neural code and reconstruct the stimulus? Okay, so here I end for today. So what we'll try, what we'll talk about tomorrow is this problem. So we'll give them the samples, we'll do the max and stuff. Uh, these are high dimensions, so we have hundreds of neurons. Um, you know, there is not enough samples, obviously, to do the direct sampling. And so we'll use maximum entropy construction to build, the, you know, models of this distribution and try to learn stuff from them and just to showcase a little bit what you can learn. All right, so I stop, I don't go over time. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Gaspar. We just convene in a couple of minutes after some database and the good for